Hello, friends. I'm Bruce Hatcher, a preacher for the Cordova Church of Christ. I'm so thankful that you are here today to join with us as we study another portion of God's Word. We certainly want to invite you to join us anytime you're able and in the area at our the location where we meet regularly, and that is 7801 Macon Road, Cordova, Tennessee. We would very much enjoy being able to meet you and worship together in spirit and in truth. For quite some time, we have been studying books throughout, found throughout the Old Testament. We have just finished a series through the tw of the 12 minor prophets, and with sprinkled within there, just as a means to break things up, uh, we also had some sermons. I remember one from the book of Job and another from the book of Ruth. And so I noticed that we've quint spent quite a bit of time lately on Old Testament passages. And so today then I thought it would be fitting for us to go back to the other side of our Bibles, uh, to the New Testament. In fact, I want you to turn all the way to the other end of your Bibles, to the book of Revelation, and then go back a few pages to the left. We want to look at that little that small, short epistle that bears the name Jude. The name Jude. Jude was actually one of our Lord's earthly brothers. That is, he was born of Mary and Joseph. And you might recall that during Jesus' earthly ministry, none of his brothers even believed that he, uh, his claims about being the Messiah. That must have been particularly difficult for Jesus to know that his own family members did not even believe him. However, uh, by the Bible, we know that something happened. We can guess maybe what that was. It probably had something to do with the resurrection and perhaps other things, but something happened that caused uh, two of his brothers at least, James and Jude, to change their course entirely. Not only did they become Christians, but by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they even wrote letters encouraging others in Christ. And so today, we want to look at this very short epistle that bears the name of Jude. Now, Jude, the epistle of Jude is placed within or classified within a category of epistles known as the general epistles. In other words, the audience is universal, general in nature, uh, not to any specific people, any specific congregation, or any specific person, but to Christians in general. We can know that by the very first verse that says, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Clearly, that describes uh, uh, that, 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 that clearly that specifies that Jude was writing to Christians, to Christians everywhere. Now, we know that his immediate audience would have been those to whom he wrote in the first century. But as with, is, is in the case with all scripture, it's also still very relevant for us today by means of application. We just need to understand uh, the context and what it meant to whom it was written, and then just simply apply that to our own to our lives today, and that's what God expects us to do. And so today, today we are actually going to look at two verses in particular. This will be an expository sermon where we will expose these two particular verses. Everything everything I say today will relate directly to verse number three and verse number four of the book of Jude. We learn in this text that it was Jude's original desire to write to his readers about our common salvation shared in Jesus Christ. It, it's common in that in, in the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, well, it's the same to everyone. God expects the same thing from all of us, Jew, Gentile, male, female, we're all one in Christ Jesus, and, and this gospel is, is, is applied to, is, is for everyone. The gospel is for all, as we say. And so, uh, reading Jude's words from verse number three, Jude says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of this common salvation, or of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. 
However, as you notice from that reading, uh, he originally set out to write of the common salvation, but something happened. There was some situation that arose that made it more needful for him to encourage his readers to earnestly contend for the faith. And what it, that situation, that situation that led to the change in his topic is found in the very next verse. Now notice verse number four with me. Verse number four reads, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, and that is, you know, other writers like Paul and John and Peter and, and Jesus himself spoke of days when these others, these certain people would creep into the fold and they would lead many away from the truth. And so uh, going on, Jude said, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, when we think about those words, I think the thing that should really give us pause immediately is the fact that such men, as are described there, that they were able to creep in unaware, or as some translations say, unnoticed. The fact that they were able to quietly and, un and sneak in to the, con to the churches unnoticed and hold these different beliefs and ideas and, and, and things that were contrary to the truth, that they were able to come into the church without anyone even noticing that should be somewhat concerning, especially despite the, the many warnings that were given by Jesus and Peter and Paul. And so, friends, I want us to realize if that, would, if that could happen then, how much easier then is it for, for, would it be for it to happen today when we live in a time far removed from those initial warnings? In light of this, Jude's call to earnestly contend for the faith becomes even more relevant for us today. And so we need to understand, first of all, the need. The need, and this is going to be the outline, the plan of our study today. We need to, first of all, understand the need to contend for the faith. Second of all, we should also understand how to contend for the faith. And so my friends, I join you to follow along with me here very closely as we highlight these two points. We'll notice number one, first of all, the need to contend for the faith. The need. You know, as we consider the need of contending for the faith today, first of all, we should notice that some will deny the all sufficiency of the scriptures. Now, this can be inferred from a particular phrase in verse number three, the, faith, the phrase that the faith that was once delivered to the saints. This phrase could also be worded one time for all time. The faith that was one time for all time delivered into the saints. In fact, the New King James Version and the American Standard 1901 translate it this way, the faith that was once for all delivered. Now, my friends, I, I, I just imagine that you understand what the phrase once and for all means. When, when something's delivered in once and for all, it's, it's one time for all time. The point being that the faith, and that is the body of doctrine that we as Christians are to believe, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it was delivered to the church one time for all time. Okay, that is a very important thing to note from Jude 3. You see, the Bible clearly teaches us that God has revealed to us all that we, he wants us to know and all that we need to know to get us to heaven, to live the life that God wants us to live and receive that eternal reward. We have everything we need. There is nothing left that God that we should be waiting on to be delivered from heaven. We have it all. Just listen to some of these verses that that agree with Jude's statement and confirm that. First, you know, the first one I want to call to your attention is Acts chapter 20, verse number 27. Paul to the Ephesians, 
said that he had not shunned to proclaim the whole counsel of God. Now, I think you will agree with me that if Paul was, did not shun to proclaim the whole counsel of God, then he had to have the whole counsel of God in order to do that. I also want to draw your attention to 2 Peter 1.3. Peter said, and this is one of those verses we, we, we always think of when we talk about the all-sufficiency of the word and that that phrase there. Maybe I should have explained that earlier for those that may not be as familiar with such a term. When we say the Bible is all sufficient, in other words, there's nothing else that we need to get us to, be, to become saved and to, to get us to heaven. Everything we need to know is there. It is a complete manual for salvation, living godly in Christ Jesus, and, etern and receiving our eternal reward. There's nothing else needed there. And a verse that we generally will will be one of the first ones on our lips when we take, talk about the all sufficiency of, of God's word is Second Peter one three, where Peter said that, <clears throat> excuse me, that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. If I think you would agree with me, if God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, there are not any things. That we are, that we should still be expecting to be delivered. God has told us He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Another verse that would be first or second on our list when we think about the all sufficiency of the scriptures is Second Timothy chapter three, verses sixteen and seventeen. Again, this time Paul writing his young protege Timothy that through the scriptures we are complete thoroughly equipped or thoroughly furnished to every good work. Again, I think that you can agree with me that if God has given us everything so that we can be spiritually complete, that we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work, there is nothing that we should be waiting for. We just simply need to study those things which God has given us. And so therefore, if we were to summarize these things together, if we have all things and we have the whole counsel of God and we are completely and thoroughly equipped, what else do we need? The answer is nothing. All is all. But with that foundation, with those things fresh on our mind, Jude, well, he reminded his readers that that the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints, it, it contained all they needed to become what God wanted them to be. He doesn't advocate his readers to search or to expect any new thing to be revealed, but rather he urges them to stand fast, to hold and defend that which they have against anyone who would suggest that there were any new form of doctrine that that had been delivered or revealed unto them. And so friends, when we take this understanding what it meant in the first century context and we apply it to our lives, understanding that we face some of the same claims in the world today, the application for us is that when people would come to us and suggest to us that there is that revelation is incomplete that it's or that it's still in progress that God is is planning to that God has laid a message on my heart, as some preachers claim, we can know that that is not true. When someone comes along like Joseph Smith and tells us that the angel Moroni has revealed a new revelation called the Book of Mormon unto them, uh, we may not know what the motivation of Joseph Smith might be in saying that, but we can know that that is false because God has told us that is not true. We can know when men like Muhammad come along and tell us that an angel has revealed to them in a cave some new doctrine that is called the doctrine of Islam, uh, the religion of the Muslims. We can know that whether or not Muhammad was insane, whether he was a criminal, or whatever his motivation might have been, we know that he's a false prophet. And we know that these things are not true. And so, therefore, it is our task to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Are you with me, dear reader? 
I hope you are. Now let's go back to our outline of our sermon today and let's notice another need to contend for the faith. Some will pervert the doctrine of grace. As we consider the need for contending for the faith today, we can also notice from what Jude wrote that some will pervert the doctrine of grace. There in verse number four, notice that there were some in Jude's day that were ungodly men who were actually turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. That word lasciviousness, we might say lewdness. It's crude and offensive things in a sensual way. It's hard to imagine that someone would turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, crude, offensive, sexual suggestions. But uh, in other words, they were using God's grace as an excuse to sin. So much so that they actually engaged in those things which were openly shameful. They were lewd. You know, as I think about this, perhaps these people had a similar mindset as to what Paul mentioned when he wrote to the Romans. Remember, Paul to the Romans said, shall we sin that grace may abound? And of course, his answer was no, we should never do that. But perhaps that was the very mindset of these individuals to whom Jude was referring. Perhaps they had were of the mindset that they could sin and go, sin and go ahead and do everything they wanted because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much I sin. God's grace is sufficient to cover all those sins. There are those today, folks, that still pervert the gospel, uh, the, or excuse me, pervert the grace of God. They teach grace. Their doctrine or teaching of grace is done in such a way as to excuse their disregard for the commandments found in God's word. Rather than trying to maintain the, a life that rigorously follows the commands of Jesus Christ, rather than, tr than striving for the righteousness that God would have all men to strive, rather than, than reaching forth to that heavenly calling, these men would continue to live as they were before. Uh, as as they were before the creatures that they were supposed to put to death and become new creatures. Instead, they would continue living in sin and debauchery, and their answer would be, well, we don't have to worry about it. God's grace is sufficient. It will cover me. They do these things to justify their lifestyle that is contrary to the principles of God's word. Chances are very likely that you've met individuals who have made such arguments, who, who live such lifestyles and have used such arguments to try to permit themselves to live in such a way. They're likely to say, God is far too loving and his grace is far too wonderful to condemn me when I am so sincere. Friends, when people come at us with things like that, you realize that we should, that is the time when we should earnestly contend for the faith. Those people who earnestly contend for the faith, they will ever be mindful that the great, of what the grace of God truly teaches. Dear friend, please, if you would, turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 with me. This is such a relevant passage to read <coughs> in regards to a situation like this. So many today out there in the religious world want to, want to act as if God's grace uh, that they shall sin, sin, uh, sin so that great God's grace may be abound. But listen to what Paul said to ti his protege ti uh, Titus. He said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And so we have some people telling us, we don't have to worry about denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We don't have to worry about sober living, righteous living, or godly living. We have God's grace to cover us, and that's all we have to worry about. Then on the other hand, we have the testimony of the inspired Apostle Paul that tells us that the, the true doctrine of grace teaches us that we should deny ungodliness, worldly lusts, and we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Friends, I think you I hope that you can see that 
that the, t- the teaching of Jude, the concerns of Jude are still very relevant today. But again, let's go back to our outline and let's look at a third point. As we consider the need of contending for the faith today, we also should notice from Jude and in our day that some will deny God's authority. You see, Jude was also dealing with those who he said in verse 4, deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There seems to be an emphasis in the verse on the word Lord that's used to describe both God and Jesus. And the term Lord is definitely a term of authority. Apparently, these people were denying the authority that rightly belongs to God and to Jesus. Today, we still often face people who deny the authority of God and Jesus. Some deny it by their lack of respect for God's word. Some people equate their own feelings with God's word. God's word says one thing and they say, well, I just feel in my heart as if their own feelings were of equal authority with God's word. And sometimes people equate human traditions. I believe uh, the Catholic Church in the Council of Trent made a decree that the church traditions were equal in authority with God's word. There again, we see people who have denied the authority of God and of Jesus Christ. Others have used, uh, equate non-inspired writings with the inspired scriptures of God that are authoritative in that way. Some usurp the Lord's preeminence within the church by setting up their own standards of authority, setting up men in positions of power. They have no authority uh, for such positions. They meet no. They do not meet the qualifications of the of those positions of of over, those overseen positions that God did deem necessary, called elders, bishops, or overseers, all the very same office. Sometimes they usurp the authority of God and Jesus Christ by creating synods, councils, and conventions and giving them power equal to the authority of the scriptures. But again, friends, those who will earnestly contend for the faith, they recognize the authority that belongs to Jesus Christ. God has set him to read Paul's words in Ephesians 1, 21 and 22, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Those who earnestly contend for the faith will recognize the authority delegated by Jesus to his apostles. John chapter 13, verse 20, Jesus said, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you that he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. And so Jesus there equated the inspired scriptures by his messengers, his inspired messengers, the apostles. He equates the, the body of inspi- the inspired testimony of scripture with his own words and with the words of the Father. And those who earnestly contend with, for the faith will understand that and they will see that. They will recognize that authority. Clearly, the need to earnestly contend for the faith is still present today, just as it was in Jude's time. And just for though it's it, just as there were those in Jude's day who denied the all sufficiency of God's word, perverted the doctrine of grace, and denied the authority of God and Jesus, so there are such people today. How then? Now then, now let's move into the second part of our of our lesson today. Let's go back to our outline, and the question now we want to consider is how to contend for the faith. We've made the case that there is a need today to contend for the faith. How then should we contend for the faith? Faith, excuse me. Well, the first answer is we must earnestly contend. That comes straight from the text. The word earnestly can be defined with as with sincere and intense conviction. With sincere and intense conviction. 
Now, in the, in the Greek, the words earnestly contend are actually one compound word. Ep, ab, ag, excuse me, ep agonizomai. Ep agonizomai. It's found only this one time in the New Testament. Now, the root of that word, I'm going to say it again, and you listen, you can hear it. The root of that word is the one from which we get our, our English word agony. Listen to it as I say it. Ep agonizomai. Do you hear the word agony within that word? The word in Greek, the root word in Greek, it means to struggle, to struggle. Well, on the front of that word, ep, ep agonizomai, that prefix epi, it means towards. And so literally what Jude, the word Jude is using here, it literally means to struggle towards or to agonize towards. You know, in literature outside of the Bible, it, it is a word that is frequently used to describe an athlete streaming with extreme intensity to win the victory in a physical competition. And so we might ask, when Jude, then why did you use such a strong term? I think Jude is reminding us that we are at war. Jude believed that the foundational tenets of the Christian faith were under attack, and they were. They still are today. And as soldiers of Christ, it is our duty to dig in, to entrench ourselves, be ready to hold the line at all cost. We must defend the faith. We must contend for the faith, which means we, <clears throat> with all our strength, with all our conviction, we must defend it at all costs. But we also must remember that the war that we are in, it is not a physical war. It is a spiritual one. And when we think of fighting a war, when we think of fighting a physical war, we might think of, 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 of physical brutality and violence, but that's not at all what is what is meant to be conveyed when it comes to this spiritual battle that we are fighting. In fact, Paul described this our our spiritual warfare in the following way. I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. Paul said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but it, or worldly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself, itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Let me read to you another passage where Paul also describes our spiritual warfare. This one from Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 13. Again, he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Friends, Jude reminds us, this is not a time to be unprepared. We must arm ourselves. We must therefore be ready to contend with vigor, with conviction, even to the point of agony for the faith that one, that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. Now, let, would you go back with me to the outline now? How do we contend for the faith? We noted that, first of all, we must earnestly contend for the faith. As a second point, and this will be our final one in our outline today, I also want us to, pay, to note this very closely. We must contend without being contentious. Please let me explain then what I mean by this. Unfortunately, I have seen in my Christian life, in, this, on, in my Christian journey, 
I've observed that some followers of Christ have sadly misinterpreted the command to contend for the faith. Perhaps it's because uh, they think of it as a war, and that's why I'm pointing out that we are in a spiritual war, not a physical war. And some people have unfortunately misinterpreted the command to contend for the faith to be a license to engage in contentions. That is, they provoke arguments. They engage in heated debates with outbursts of anger. It seems like they're always looking for something to argue about from Scripture. My friends, please, please note that such actions are not, first of all, exemplary of our Lord. Go back and study the example of our Lord. How was our Lord when he, when he contended for the faith, when he, st- when he talked to others about things and saw others in error? What, how did he handle that? Was he rude? Was he obnoxious? Was he boisterous? Was he, was he condemning all the time? Or was he not very loving and meek and caring? Furthermore, this, these, types of, these types of attitudes, they are not at all helpful in showing the world the love of Christ. And they are certainly not implied by Jude's urge for us to contend for the faith. Rather, please note this, rather Christians are actually warned against such behavior. The first place I want you to note with me, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21. The opening is Galatians 5, 19 through 21. <clears throat> now, Paul <clears throat> said, that, <clears throat> said that some of these things, these, this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this contentiousness that we're talking about, these behaviors that I noted I have observed from Christians, he said that these things were obvious and unmistakable works of the flesh. Notice Paul said, now the works of the flesh are manifest, or some translations say are evident or evident. All right. And so now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. And then Paul begins to give a list of sinful works of the flesh. And let me just direct you to verse number 20 and point out in the King James Version, the word variance, which other translations have as strife. And I believe it may be the New King James Version that translates it contentions. There you have it, contentions. Contention is a work of the flesh. Continuing on, he lists in the King James Version, wrath which other translations translates as outbursts of wrath or fits of anger. And then he continues, as I have also told you in the in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Friends, don't fool yourself and think that it's okay to be ugly and spiteful and hateful with people because you are contending for the faith. Paul said it is a work of the flesh. It's sinful. Even the Apostle Paul himself, one who bore apostolic authority and one who actually came from a past of using violence against heretics, even Paul, when correcting the Corinthians, said in 2 Corinthians 10.1, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech or beg you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Notice Paul pointed out the meek and gentle attitude of Christ in correcting people, and Paul indicated that he was following suit. Now, if anyone, if we would expect anyone to really just absolutely get ugly and just really let somebody have it, we would think it'd be Paul, wouldn't we? But that is, was not Paul's method. <clears throat> he wrote to the Galatians, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one, please notice, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And in other words, let's practice the golden rule here, folks. How would you want someone to approach you? If you were at fault, if you were doing something wrong, maybe even teaching something wrong and and not even really understanding that it was wrong, what you were teaching, how would you want someone to approach you over that? 
Would you want them to be hateful, ugly, act like they're really trying to make an example out of you and call you out in a crowd? Is that the way you would want to be approached or would you rather them approach you in a spirit of meekness? I know that I know my answer and I think I know yours. Finally, and this is the one that uh, is most pointed as it pertains to our discussion. Please turn with me to one more scripture. Second Timothy chapter two. If you'll turn to Second Timothy chapter two, verses 23 through 25, please follow along with me here. And this is, as someone said, this is it and it doesn't get any itter. OK, notice. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they what? They do gender strives. Oh, and notice this next verse, this next statement. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Another word for strive is be contentious. A servant of the Lord must not strive. You mean not even to contend for the faith? No. But be gentle unto all men, even heretics, all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Friends, I certainly thank you for joining us for this study today. It has been a delight studying this and preparing it for you. And before we go, I just want to just summarize again what we've learned today. We've learned that there is a definite need in our day to contend for the faith. There are many false doctrines, false teachers, compromises, and con men out there. And they often prey upon the naive and the ignorant by suggesting that they have some new revelation from God or that, that they themselves are a direct conduit to God. They pervert the gospel of Christ and turn the law which was meant for righteousness into lasciviousness. Don't be fooled, friends. Everything that God wants us to know and everything that we need to be saved and live faithfully in Christ Jesus has been given us. It is right there in the word of God, right in black and white. All we have to do is study it. Study to show thyself approved unto God. The workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And while we must have a conviction and a steadfastness in defending the faith, we must not allow ourselves to become cold or calloused toward others in doing so. We must contend but never be contentious. We must be, as Jesus said when he sent his disciples out, Matthew 10, 16, we must be wise as serpent and harmless as doves. In other words, we want to we wanna be smart. We want to use our mental faculties to strategize as best we can. But when it comes to confronting others, we want to be harmless. We want to be gentle. Friends, don't miss that. Don't miss that. And if we do this properly, not only will we be good soldiers of Christ, we might just be good soul winners at the same time. As others will look at us, see our good works, and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Friends, I want to end with a prayer and an invitation to Jesus Christ. If you would, pray with me. Our Father God, we are so thankful to you for Jesus Christ, for the great example he gave us. We're thankful, Father, for this message from Jude that we have looked at today. We pray, Father, that everyone listening to this and everyone reading this scripture will search their hearts, will understand the truth of it, and they will apply this and not only be strong defenders of the faith, but they will also be gentle and meek in doing so. We pray, Father, that the church, near and far, would apply these things and that we can reach out to those lost souls. We pray, Father, that you would open doors of opportunity, open doors of sincere searching hearts so that we might uh, show them the truth of thy word and lead them home to thee. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus. In his name, amen. Friends, I want to close with the invitation of Jesus Christ today. If you are not a child of God, the Bible is pretty clear in what we must do. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. Peter, uh, Paul told us that baptism is a, is, is a mean, it's a enactment, it's a reenactment of Christ's death on the cross. 
And like as Christ was dead, like as Christ was uh, buried and raised from the dead and was raised in newness of life, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, that that also symbolizes the death of our old man. We are buried with him in baptism and we are risen with him to walk in newness of life. Peter said that baptism doth now save us. 1 Peter chapter 3, 21. Friend, if you're out there, we would just ask you to follow the gospel plan of salvation, the one that we see throughout the scriptures, throughout the book of Acts. The book of Acts was given to us so that we could know how the early church was structured, how the early converts went about and carried the gospel to all the world, what people did to obey the gospel, the challenges they faced, and how they overcome them. That is the book of Acts. That is the history of the church, the first 35 years of the church eminently important, extremely important to us. And every example of conversion follows the same plan. They heard the gospel preached. They believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They had penitent hearts and were willing to change. And so they made that they confessed that they believed in Jesus Christ. They were baptized and had their sins forgiven. Acts chapter 2 verse 38, including Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 22 verse 16, and then their name was added to the Lamb's book of life. And if they lived faithfully unto death, then heaven was their home. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. That is the plan that God has given us through his word. And his word, as we taught, as we learned today, is all sufficient. We don't need anything else. We don't anyone, need anyone to come along and tell us, I have some new revelation. That's not how God wants us to do it anymore, like, like Joseph Smith did. We just need to follow the revelation God has given us, the revelation that God has preserved throughout all ages so that every generation can be saved. Again, we thank you for joining us today, and we want to invite you back We'll uh, each and every week. And if you're ever in our area, please visit us. We would love to get to know you. Until we meet again, God bless you.